Welcome to the Brown Bag Lecture. Our lecture runs every Tuesday from September until the end of March, from noon till one o'clock. And we have a variety of speakers who come and uh, talk to us about things like, uh, Linda Llewellyn is gonna talk to us about burn awareness and uh, talking from your own personal experience. Um, Linda actually sent me a, an email and said, I see you have an empty spot on your uh, schedule. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I would love to have you come in and, and share your experiences. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Linda. Thank you for the introduction. Welcome on this beautiful sunny day. We'd all like to be outside in, I'm sure. Um, although it's not as warm as it looks. <laughs> um, I'm Linda Llewellyn. Um, some people for years would have known me as Linda Fraser because that's what I was for several years until 11 years ago when I got married. Uh, I was burnt on February 4th, 1983 in Edmonton. I woke up that morning at the usual time, probably about 7.20 to get ready for work. But normally what happened at our house in the morning was my son, Adam, who was just about five, would normally come in and wake me up and then go get himself some cereal while I got ready for work. On this particular morning, he didn't come in and wake me up. He woke up and found some matches. And so he started to play with them. Pretty typical behavior for a five-year-old. I would say boy, but I think girls probably do it too. Um, so that when I woke up, I went out to see what was going on, and I found that my living room was totally engulfed in flames. And Adam was sitting in the middle of it, staring at his hands, just kind of doing this. I called him, and he didn't respond. He didn't look up, he didn't do anything. He just kept staring at his hands. Probably he was in shock. Certainly he was afraid. And so without thinking about what would happen to me, I did what any parent would do. I ran into those flames and I got him. And I tucked him in under my arm, sort of like a football. Remembered all the things we had been taught about getting down low. And I went over to the front door and went to open it. But it was locked and had swollen with the heat and my hand burnt and I quickly let go. And so then I got down and I crawled down the hallway to my room, which was the furthest room from the fire. I closed the doors as I went down the hall and I went in the room and I shut the door and I rolled us both in the blankets on my bed to put out the flames. And then I went over to the window and opened it up to get some fresh air and looked down the three stories and there were all my neighbors. They had heard the alarms in the hallway. They had phoned the fire department. And in fact, I started to hear the sirens about the time I got to the window. But as you can see, I burnt my hands pretty badly. And I was suddenly having trouble holding on to this child out the window. And I looked down and I said to one of my neighbors, can you catch him? Because I can feel him slipping out of my hands. And he's a big biker guy. And he said, yeah, I can do that. And so he, I closed my eyes, dropped him. And when I opened him, he had him by his heels. And I had no idea whether he'd hit in the ground or what had gone on. Um, but apparently it was fine. He got him. And then they took him and put him in a tub full of cool water on, in one of the suites on the other side of the building and down a floor. What that did for Adam was stop the burning process right then and there. And so his burns never went as deep. They didn't cover as much of his body. And he actually healed fairly quickly. He still spent two months in hospital. And he had one surgery in a hospital on his hands and forearms. But that's been it until just before Christmas. So 40 years later, he got some releases done on one arm because it had gotten too tight and he couldn't lift and do the jobs that he wanted to do. Um, but he's done really well. He had a great time at physio because he rode a bike all over the place and played basketball and did all kinds of fun stuff for physio. So for him, the memories are more about the fun stuff and he doesn't remember the pain and he doesn't remember being in the hospital, but he can remember playing which is what they did for his recovery. I, on the other hand, spent a lot longer in the hospital. I was on the window ledge for maybe a minute or two while the fire department got there and put the ladder up. 
And then they put the ladder up and the fireman came up and said, I can't take you. The ladder's not secure enough. We need to put up a second ladder. And I said, well, I'm not going back in there because it's full of smoke. And they said, that's okay. And we did, he hung out on the, on the windowsill with me while they put up the second ladder and the two of them took me down and put me in an ambulance. And when they first put me in, they put me in on my stomach because that's the least burned area. However, it hurt like crazy and I kept complaining and so they finally flipped me over onto my back, which is the worst burned area. However, because it's so badly burned, it didn't hurt because I burned all the nerve endings. So there was no pain as I laid on the back. I got to the hospital. I told the nurses or whoever was checking me in, I gave them my name, Adam's name, our birth dates. Um, I gave them our doctor's name. I gave them the phone number for my mother in Toronto, my brother who was in, stationed in Winnipeg with the Air Force at the time, my ex-husband who lived here in Penticton with my other two boys and his, his wife. He, and they phoned all these people and by the time my ex-husband had hung up the phone, his wife was packing her, his clothes so he could come up and make sure we were okay. And her and I are still really good friends to this day. I tell everybody she's the blessing from my fire because <laughs> now we have this great friendship and we've raised kids together and we just share children and grandchildren as if it's a normal thing to do for two women. It is to us anyway. I wound up spending eight months in the hospital and another year and a half doing physiotherapy. And for the first probably four or five months, I laid on a bed kind of in, I always called it airplane position, stretched out. So because scars are lazy, and so they take the shortest route possible. So if they don't stretch your arms out like this, you're probably not going to get your hands any higher than this. And even as I've aged, this is about as high as I can get my arms anymore because of the tightening of the scars. The problem with children getting burned is that as they grow, the scars don't stretch and they don't grow with them. And so children who are burnt really badly, and I've met a few of them, wind up in hospital every year, missing some school, while they have another surgery, another release to allow the growth to happen. I spent a year and a half after I got out of the hospital going back every day for physiotherapy. Mostly we worked on my hands, trying to get them the fingers to bend and work again. This is as much bend as I get. It's okay. I don't think I've ever needed a fist. I don't think I've ever been that mad. Um, and they work fine. I can't sew, but then I didn't like to sew anyway, so it's okay. <laughs> uh, but I can do all the things I want to do, and I've learned to adjust and adapt. Um, I went back to school for two years when I was finished doing physiotherapy to do window display, which I did for about a year at Woodward's and decided it really wasn't my thing. And so then I went back to school again and did a social work program. I've worked in MLA's offices and MP's offices. And I worked in, in a senior center in, in downtown Edmonton for hard to house seniors. So the ones that are homeless, the ones that are maybe have a home, but they, they don't look after it well because they're alcoholics or they have mental health problems. It was an amazing job, and I did it for 10 years and absolutely loved it. But then somebody came up to me and said, how would you like to teach burn prevention? And I went, yeah, gladly. And I spent the next 10 years traveling across Canada, based out of Edmonton, but traveling across Canada, teaching prevention in schools across the country, and kept stats, and for the last five years at least, I was speaking to 10,000 students and teachers a year. So I figured that made a difference in somebody's life somewhere along the way. Um, but it was, it was really a challenge, and it was really a challenge I loved, t talking to students about what had happened to me, but also talking to them about prevention so it wouldn't happen to them. And I also said I think one of the biggest gifts I gave the girls in particular was that I think my doctor did an amazing job, and I love the way I look. And teenagers are so wanting to be like everybody else. To have somebody look as different as me, say, I like the way I look, is a gift. Because then they can understand that they don't have to look the same as everybody else. They can still be beautiful. I also used to kid around that I've always wanted to go into politics, and now I have a face for politics, because 
isn't that the big thing, remembering the person? <laughs> and people always remember me. So it was really, you know, and, and I fulfilled that dream. I, I was telling Chandra before, I moved to Tassis, and if you don't know where Tassis is, look it up afterwards. It's on the west coast of Vancouver Island. You can't get any further west in Canada. Um, it's a remote little village, was once a mill town, but now has about 200 to 300 people living in it. And I went into politics there and, and was on city council, or town council, for the four year, last four years I was there. So it gave me that chance, I did that. I've had probably 35 or 40, somewhere in that area, reconstructive surgeries, all done by a plastic surgeon. Now if we watch TV and movies and Hollywood in general, plastic surgery is supposed to work miracles and make us look however we want to look. And I thought that's how it worked. And I was laying in my bed the first time I looked at my face in a mirror and the doctor was there and the nurse was there and my physiotherapist was there and I went, oh, but it's okay because you can make me look like I used to look because they had all these pictures around. And my doctor just looked at me and went, no, sorry, Linda, we can't do that. You have to use your own skin. You don't have a lot of it to use, so it has to go as far as it will go. They used mostly my legs. These cheeks came from these cheeks. <laughs> so it's kind of fun. Um, but I think they did a great job. And, and they listened to me about what I wanted. When I was first burnt, my lips were like, this one was down here, and this one was turned up. And so I went to a meeting of all the plastic surgeons because my doctor was trying to talk me into getting my nose rebuilt because it I lost all the tip of my nose, and I was okay with it. And he was like, no, 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 we'll do your nose. And, I, and so one of the other surgeons said in the meeting, he said, what do you want done, Linda? And I went, I want my lips done. I mean, this is the inside of your lips. It doesn't hold lipstick, we're the darn. <laughs> Not that I ever wear it now anyway, but I wanted that option. Um, and so they did my lips first, and then eventually I let them do my nose. And now every time I see him, he goes, you have a really cute nose. I did a good job on that. <laughs> he's really fun. He's, he's, um, he was um, just at one year out of residency when I went in. So I was one of his first big patients, I do believe. When they gave me the chance to teach prevention, I jumped at it because I thought, the kids are, I'm not t I don't tell them anything different than, than they'd hear from the firemen that come out every year to schools, except that, when you look at me, you know I know what I'm talking about. Because <laughs> I've been there, I've done that. And I did a lot of research. I also went to a, several conferences, and one of the conferences I went to had a session on Burns and the elderly. And there was a bunch of us went to it thinking they were gonna tell us how our skin was gonna age. And we all wondered how that was gonna happen. Because it's already a little thin, and your skin thins as you get older. It's tight, and skin loses its elasticity as it gets older. And, you know, like there was lots of things that we wondered how it was going to age. But when we got there, the session was actually about burns that happen to the elderly and why they're at risk. So while 95% of the people in the room were very disappointed, and I was somewhat disappointed, I also grabbed at that to understand better what happens with seniors. Why do they get burnt? How do they get burnt? And it's interesting because in the senior population, so over 65, and then the population under the age of six, the burns are very similar. And the cause of the burn is very similar. And I, while we mostly think of fire as how people get burnt, 60% of the children and probably about the same percentage of seniors that get burnt actually get burnt from scalding. And the reason that that is so similar is because our skin is thinner and because at the age of five, six, and in that area, our skin is still thinner, it hasn't reached its full thickness, its full maturity, it will burn at a lower temperature and it will burn much quicker. So the scars will go deeper. And on top of that with seniors, we're on medication, so our reflexes are probably slower. 
and we don't respond as quickly to that scalding that's happening. I had a senior I worked with in Edmonton who spilt coffee on his foot. We've probably all spilt coffee on ourselves somewhere. It should have just been fine, but because he didn't understand the whole concept of clean it up and cool it down and keep it clean, it wasn't, and he wound up in the hospital for a week. He wound up with surgery on that foot to put new skin on it because it went deeper and deeper and deeper because he didn't look after it. The way that people get burnt in homes is, of course, a lot of it is fire, and yes, we heard my son was playing with matches. That is one of the causes of fires. The three leading causes of house fires in North America are smoking materials, so cigarettes, lighters, matches, candles, and can anybody guess what the third one would be? Hmm? Fires in, in, in your house? We've got the matches and lighters, got candles. Cooking, yeah, stove. Cooking, leaving the kitchen while you're cooking and, and not paying attention to it. So those are our three leading causes of fires in North America and have been for years. And while we try and reduce it, not everybody seems to get the message. But people also get burnt in other ways. And that was what I learned as I went along. People get burnt by sun. We get sunburns. Most of us get a little sunburn at some point in our life. Some, some people get serious sunburn. And again, if you don't look after it, cool it down. And when I say cooling down a burn, I don't mean put ice on it because that could put you into shock because you're changing the temperature too quickly, but rather cool it. So if you burnt yourself in the kitchen, say, stick it under the sink tap at a tepid temperature for about five minutes to pull all that heat out. People also get burnt by, in, and maybe not so much in the Okanagan because we don't reach those really cold temperatures very often, but when I lived in, in Edmonton, believe me, it was a problem, frostbite. And frostbite is what they call a cold thermal burn. So the result is the same. The skin is damaged. We need to figure out how to fix it. Again, warming the person up slowly to bring them back to their right temperature is important. Paying attention to do they need to see a doctor. And I always figure that if you've got a burn that's very big, so maybe the size of your palm, you probably should see a doctor. If it's blistered, hopefully it will heal on its own, but keep an eye on it and don't break the blister because that's protecting it from getting infected. It's protecting it and helping it heal. If it's beyond a blister, if it's even deeper, then you definitely need to see a doctor so that they can make sure it's treated properly, make sure it keeps clean, make sure it's not infected. People also get burned by friction. So common friction burns are things like rug burn or, or road rash when we fall off our bikes and stuff like that. But the friction burn is something that's pretty common in children. Again, it's keeping it clean, making sure it hasn't gone very deep, making sure that it's protected as it heals. People get burnt by chemicals. And if we're working with chemicals, we should know what we're doing when we work with chemicals. We should read the label beforehand to know what we need to do if this spills on us, because you're not gonna have time to read it if you've spilt it on yourself. You're gonna get a burn. So you need to know that ahead of time and, how, and be prepared for it. People need to pay attention to their surroundings with the liquids and the hot water and stuff. I remember a young girl that I men mentored for a lot of years, um, she got burnt because she was, what, three, I think. Mom had made the soup. She'd put it on the counter, way at the back of the counter, and then gone to the bathroom. And this little girl pushed a chair up and pulled the soup towards her and wound up spilling it down herself and spilling it in this area. And so she's got scars for the rest of her life um, because the soup was too hot. The hot water tanks in our house can be turned down to medium and still be hot enough to do our dishes and our laundry if you use hot water for laundry. But at least then it's not going to scald anybody very quickly if, they, if their hand is under it. P children sitting on laps, so we've got grandkids. My grandkids are all now 
one of them's like 19 today, so <laughs> um, they're all big, but when they were little and sitting on your lap, if you're drinking a hot coffee or a tea, they grab for it very quickly. It's being aware that those things are around. I want to leave time for questions because I really feel like questions are important. So if anybody has any questions, please put your hand up at any time, um, and I will answer them. And if not, we'll try at the end to see if anybody has any questions. I had to learn to walk again when I was burned. And, and, and people will see me walking now, and I know that I've had kids tease me about how I walk, because I walk toes first, because my legs swelled up and, and cut off the circulation of my feet, and I wound up um, losing mobility. The tendons and, and muscles were damaged permanently. And I always have to say thank you to the nurses, because it was a nurse that noticed my legs were swelling that badly. Had she not noticed, I might have lost both legs. But she did notice within 24 hours of me being in, and so my first surgery was 24 hours. And they, all they did was cut open both legs down to the muscle and let, let them drain, and then went back in later and put grafts on it to, for them to heal. And so as a result, I have damage, but I can walk. I'm, I think that's pretty lucky. I can still get around. But I had to learn to walk again, and I'm laying in the bed, and it was like I was burnt February, it was May, beginning of May, they got me some braces to get up and, and to learn to walk around. Um, and I, two days after I got my braces, I went to a sold out concert at the Jubilee Auditorium in Edmonton, which is a fairly nice theater. Um, if you've been to the Venables, probably like that only, it holds 2,000 as opposed to 400, but about that same type of setup. And it was really interesting to go to this concert because I had said to the doctor at one point, you know, there's this concert coming that I'd really like to go to. Do you think if things stay the way they are or get a little bit better, I can have a pass to go out to it? And he said, yeah, I don't see why not. That sounds like a good thing to be doing. And so the day before the concert, and this time I already had tickets, the day before the concert he comes in and goes, I think we're gonna take you in for surgery tomorrow. And I looked at him and went, I have a concert tomorrow night. <laughs> no. And again, he listened to me. And he realized that that concert was just as important as any surgery he might want to do. Because your mental health is as important as your physical health. And your physical health heals better if your mental health is good. So he said, OK, fine. We'll wait. We'll do surgery next week. And they did surgery the next week, and they did something totally different than he was originally planning on doing, because what he was originally planning on doing healed up better, <laughs> being left alone. But I went, so my girlfriend picked me up. Um, we went to her place and had supper. We had to go somewhere and buy some clothes, because I didn't have any clothes. Um, and we went to this concert, and we got there late, and it's dark, and I'm like just learning to walk in these braces, going up to the top level, <laughs> holding on to people's knees as I went. And, but I got up there and thoroughly enjoyed it. And the concert was Ricky Skaggs. I'm a country fan. Um, 10 years ago, I was in Nashville for Fan Fest, and Ricky Skaggs was at his booth. And I stood in line and told him that story, because it felt like a full circle thing to be able to say, you were part of my recovery. You were a big part of my recovery. And he was thrilled to be able to see that. And then I went that night to the Ryman and saw him in, in the, at the Opry. It was great. So recovery was steps, and I had this burn survivor friend, and one of the things that happened for me was I had burn survivors come up and talk to me and tell me how they had gotten through it. So it helped to talk to other people. But I had this one per particular person who said to me, Linda, I think you're in for a big fall because you've never said, oh, poor me. You've never felt sorry for yourself. You've never f gone through the blues of being burned. And I went, Hmm, that's interesting. So I had this psychologist I was talking to at the time, and I'll never forget her name because it was Nancy Reagan. Um, <laughs> and if you think 80, that's probably a good timing. <laughs> um, she said to me, you know what, Linda, not everybody hits those highs and lows. Not everybody hits that bottom because they live life more like this than like this. 
and that's how you seem to live your life, is like this. And I've certainly been somebody who's always been able to find the best in everything, find the joys in life, and that's why I try and tell people that there's joy and there's sorrow in our life. The sorrow part we have to live through, and we should learn from it, but we shouldn't hold on to it. But the joy, the joy is something to hang on to all the time and to bring out when we need it. And there's always joy in every situation. There always is. There's always positives to everything. My positive, personally, on on my burns, besides the fact that I now have this great friend in Pat, is I always wanted to teach. When I was a kid and people asked me, from grade two on, what was I going to do? I was going to be a teacher. And then I finished grade 12 to my dad's grade 9. <laughs> and my dad said, well, you've got your education, now go get a job. And within a year I was married and having children. <laughs> and I gave up that dream. And then when I was told I could do this burn prevention thing, it was like being able to fulfill that dream of being a teacher. And I would, I would go to the schools and I'd sit in the staff room with the teachers and they all just treated me like another one of the teachers. They all accepted me as being a colleague. So I got to be a teacher for 10 years um, in a roundabout way, but I did. Um, I've certainly had adults come up to me now because it's been since 2010, since I've been teaching, I've had adults come up to me now and tell me they remember me being at their school and they remembered some of the story and they they appreciate it. Um, When I said I have a face that people can remember, when we were, my husband and I got back together, we originally met in Penticton in 1981, but then we went our separate ways. 11 years ago, in December, somebody got us back together, but he was living in England and I was living in Penticton. So he moved over here and we decided that we had thought about each other all those years and so we were must meant to be and we decided to get married. So we went to um, get a marriage license and I'm sta- we're standing there filling it out. It's always fun for us to fill out forms because we have the same birthday. Seven years apart but the same birthday. So when they so- start writing down the birthdays they get to the second one and they go Wait a minute. (laughs) But while we were doing all of that, this woman pops her head over and goes, is your name Linda? And I went, yeah. She said, I taught you. I took an entrepreneurial training course for women. When I was unemployed for a while, unemployment put me through this course, and she was one of my instructors, and it was probably 25 years before that that she had been my instructor, but she remembered me. couldn't really remember which course class she even taught, but she remembered me. And so that's why I said, I have a face people always remember. <laughs> and I'm, I'm good with that. I'm okay with that. When I moved back here in 2010, I actually worked at the Starbucks downtown, and I loved it. I had a great time there. I, when they closed it, I was living in Tassos by the time they closed it. I was shocked that they closed it, because we were always crazy busy, always. But apparently not busy enough for Starbucks. <laughs> So they've gone through actually to drive throughs now, pretty much. Um, I truly love living in the Okanagan. When I moved away in 1981 to move up to Edmonton, it was more because my son was three at the time and I wanted to give him better opportunities. At that point, there was just Penn High, and if you didn't fit in at Penn High, you dropped out of school. Now there's Maggie, so there's choices, but there wasn't at that point. And uh, so I went up to Edmonton with the idea of of doing something uh, other than bartending, because that's what I did here, was a bartender for the five, six years that I lived here. But I always knew that I would come back to the Okanagan someday. I always knew this is where I wanted to retire. Um, So I moved back here in 2010 once the funding dried up for me teaching prevention because it was through a nonprofit and the funding just wasn't there anymore and I needed to downsize and find a different lifestyle and I was working part-time at Starbucks so I just moved here instead. And then when my husband came back into my life, um, we got married at Kickaninny, that really beautiful park out there, um, 
and we were in the apartment right next door here, and he was just, he wanted something more than Penticton. He didn't, it wasn't, he wanted to move to the island. So we moved over to the island, and we lived there for seven years, but, and I loved it. It's a beautiful spot, but I always knew I wanted to be here. I wanted to be in the Okanagan. I have friends here that I've had for 40 years. My kids are in Sycamus, Penticton, and, and North Van, so this is kind of in between everybody. Um, so when we moved back, we moved to Oliver. I love Oliver. It's a beautiful little town, and it's close enough to Penticton to come and visit. I wouldn't live anywhere else now, and he can go move wherever he wants. <laughs> he's always wanting to move somewhere. He's got itchy feet, I think. Um, but I, I truly, I think the Okanagan's a beautiful place to live if you can, if you can manage to live here. Um, I said to somebody recently, they were talking about Penticton, about um, the pros and cons of Penticton, and I said, you know what, there's pros and cons wherever you live. You need to figure out what you can live with, and this is where I can live. I love it here. I really have not ever, ever, I don't think in 41 years, wished to go back to that day and, and start over. Never. I've always wanted to go forward. I've always wanted to see where this was going to lead me. And I think it's led me some pretty interesting places and introduced me to some very incredible people over the years. I have traveled to Taiwan with children as a, as a chaperone when we took kids over to burn camp in Taiwan, which was a great experience, but it was July and very hot. <laughs> and we hiked a mountain in that heat. We also swam in the ocean, but it was a great experience. And I've gone to England because of um, being at school, and we went to England for part of my schooling. I've traveled extensively throughout the states to conferences for burn survivors, so all over the states. Um, I've been to 17 or 18 of them, I think, now. Plus, they have them now in Canada, and I've been to the ones in Canada. So and I've got to travel as far west as you can go to live in Tassis, but also east to Cape Breton. So I've been able to travel a fair bit of this country and seen a fair bit of it. I've talked at schools. In Cape Breton, I talked to, I went for a week, and we talked to 14 different grade four and five classes in that week. Um, I went to Ottawa, just outside of Ottawa, to Russell, Ontario, and spoke to the students there, and spoke to 2,500 students in the week that I was there. I've been to Saskatchewan, and I've been to the island and to the Okanagan for teaching, and then pretty much all of Alberta. I don't think there's a road in Alberta I haven't traveled down at some point. Um, if it leads to a town, I've been on it. <laughs> um, and I, I wouldn't trade all of those memories for anything because isn't that what we have as we get older, our memories and the things we did. And I've been very fortunate to see a great deal of the world and a great deal of this country. And I wouldn't have, I don't think, had I not been burned because the burns have what led me to where I am. Okay, I'm going to leave it open to questions. Does anybody have any questions? What they used, and I don't know about really recently, but what, when I was burnt, they called it first, second, and third degree burns. Now they call it superficial, deep, and, and, and super deep or something. They, they, they have, but first, second, so first degree burn is that sunburn, that superficial burn. It burns a layer of skin off maybe. Um, a second, what we used to call second degree burns are those ones with the, with the blister on them. And most second degree burns should heal on their own if they're well looked after. But they can turn into third degree burns if they're not, if they get infected. And third degree burn goes even deeper. It's taken off several layers of skin. Some people that I've met have had even deeper than, they, they call it fourth degree or deep third, where it's actually gone into the muscle and the bone. And usually then you lose that, it's usually in appendages and you lose the limbs. Um, noses are really easy to be gone because there's no bone there. S and same with ears. <laughs> the doctor came in one time to my room and I was all bandaged up, but it was fairly early on. And he went, I've never seen anybody so acute with their ears still intact. And I thought he said cute. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what? We, yeah, we talk about it once in a while, Adam. And, I, and, and in fact, we spent 
couple of years talking to other kids who were playing with matches, and he would tell them his story. And I w he would go off with the kids and tell his story to just the kids while I sat with the parents. Um, so he's talked about, and he, and he certainly can tell you the story, even though he doesn't necessarily remember it. Um, but I have, even recently I've talked to him about, because he had this surgery, and I said, did it bring back any flashbacks or any trauma? And he said, no, no, it, it didn't. Um, he is one of the most incredible human beings in the world, and I know I'm his mom, and I'm supposed to say that. However, my thing is he's got a great heart, and he, he's one of those people that everybody's a friend he hasn't met, and he takes people as he finds them. He's non-judgmental, and he just accepts everybody as, as a friend. He's the person who's going to drive down and pick up the hitchhiker and take them home for dinner. And I've been in the car when he's done it, so I know he does. Um, but this is, and I know that sounds like a mom bragging, but when he, he went to Australia when he was in his 20s for a year. He had a work visa and he went over there for a year. And the girl that he was seeing while he was there put a memory book together and she had everybody, took everybody's picture and put them on a page and had them all write something in this memory book. Over half the people that wrote in this memory book said the thing they liked the most about Adam was his heart that he had a great heart. And so even though I've been saying for years he's got a great heart, that was really interesting to see that that's what other people see. That's how other people see him. He has a great heart. My middle son has just recently been dating somebody and she came for Christmas with the whole family. And it's my ex-husband has passed away, but his wife and myself and then all of our kids and grandkids and whatever. So it's kind of an interesting family mix. Um, and she was a little nervous about meeting us. And I went, I don't know why you'd be worried about meeting us. We're the most accepting family in the world. Just come on in. Whatever you are, we're going to accept you. And that's true. You know? um, our one grandson who is 15, when he was three, we went, drove up to Kelowna, because that's where my daughter-in-law's family is, and to visit because they had the new baby, the, the next one down. Um, and... As we're driving out, my ex's wife and I are driving out together. The three-year-old standing there going, bye, grandmas. <laughs> and I thought, how great is that? He's going to grow up just, that's normal, right? That's normal. And wouldn't that be nice if that was normal, that the marriage didn't work, but that doesn't mean we have to fight or make kids choose or, you know. It, it can all just be a big family, and that's what we are. We're just one big family. And my Pat and I always say, thanks for sharing the kids, or we did a great job with those guys, didn't we? Because <laughs> she had the oldest two from the time they were five and eight. The middle one came back to me at 15. So we both had input into their lives, and it just is. You know, it's just how our family evolved, and it works really well. Vancouver. I think is the closest for serious burns here. Th I think they probably treat smaller burns in, in, in Kelowna, but here you'd go to Vancouver. So in, in BC, it's Vancouver. In Alberta, it's Edmonton and Calgary. Now, if you're in the Northwest Territories or Alaska or any up, or the Yukon, I mean up there, you're, a lot of those go to, northern, to, to Edmonton. So Edmonton serves everybody north of Red Deer and all of the territories for the most part. Um, and they come down to BC. I always figure we were very fortunate to be in Edmonton. One, it was a world-class hospital, um, teaching hospital, university, um, great doctors, um, cutting edge of anything that was happening. But for me personally, on a personal level, I'm glad I was there. Because in Calgary, if we had been in Calgary, Adam would have been in a different hospital because they had the burn unit for the kids in the kids' hospital and the burn unit for the adults in a different hospital, totally different hospital. And honestly, what kept me going in the beginning was being able to see Adam. So for that first two months that he was in hospital, he, he could stand at my door and talk to me. To come in, he had to put a gown and mask and everything else on, and so he would stand at the door and just talk to me. Um, having him, And I could see him hanging out at the nursing station, talking to the nurses, or playing on his bike, or whatever. And so that kept me going. That gave me some purpose to get better, because I didn't walk into that fire to save him for somebody else to raise him. I'm going to raise him. And 
he, um, so he and his presence was really important to my recovery. And had he been in a totally different hospital, I don't know how I would have dealt with that. It was being able to see him. And they actually kept him in the hospital for about two weeks longer than he needed to be because they could see that it was helping me to recover, to be able to see him and interact with him. But at some point, they had to let him. They needed the room, and they had to let him go. So he went into a foster home. The woman was a burn nurse who was off with a back injury. So, and he was their first foster child, and they've had like probably 100 foster kids since, but he was their first, and, and he's still in touch with them. So he's actually, Adam's lucky, he's got me, he's got Pat, and he's got a foster mom. <laughs> so Adam got to have three moms. And I remember having somebody ask me one time how I felt about that, and I went, he's got enough love for all three of us. I don't see a problem with it. Um, isn't he lucky to have three women who love him and nurture him and, and guide him? It depended on the school. Yeah, yeah. It depended on the school. Some schools, I would do the individual classrooms. Some, I would do kindergarten to grade three, and then five to six, because they have middle schools in Alberta. Um, sometimes it would be in a gym full of kids. So it depended. Um, the program changed a little, depending on the age. With the littlest kids, so grade three and under, I have a, a book I take with me called No Dragons for Tea. And it's a Canadian written book about a fire that happens in the house because the dragon sneezes from pepper. <laughs> and it talks about getting down and crawling and it stop, stop, drop, and roll. And it's a great teaching tool because it does all of that. It talks about all the things the kids need to do. At the end of it, there's a little rhyme and we can go through it step by step. And the kids, t I get the kids to practice stop, drop, and roll. Stop, drop, and roll works if you remember to do it. Think about when you're panicked, how much you forget. And so that they teach it to the little, they teach it to the kids all the way through school, and the older kids are going, yeah, or whatever. But it's because if you're panicked, somebody in the group might remember and do the stop, drop, and roll. And it's really important to do it properly. It's important not to do it too fast. It's important to, to, to d roll back and forth and to put your hands over your face so that your face is protected. Kids always go, well, what if my hands are on fire? Well, then don't put them at your face. <laughs> it's as simple as that. But kids love to ask those kind of questions. So, um, but it, it, yeah, the program varied a little bit. And certainly, the details I would go into with what I went through would be different for the smaller kids. I would go into much more detail, um, and particularly at the high school level. Yeah, to the age group, yeah. So like I had this kid, these, uh, this high school group one time that was being kind of, you know, like smart ass It's the best word for it. Um, one of the kids was sitting there flicking a lighter through the whole class. Um, then I get a little more detailed. So then I, they, then I talk about in a much more graphic detail about when they lay the scar, when they s lay the skin on, and you can see that I've got like kind of bumps on my arms, and that's that the skin that they took from my legs, they take a patch maybe this big, but they want to cover all of this. So they put it through this machine called a meshing machine, and it puts a whole bunch of holes in it, and then it stretches. And so then they lay it down and s and on wherever they're putting it and staple it in place. Now the bumps are where the scar tissue is then formed in those holes, and it will al they will always be there. There's smaller ones on my fingers because it's a smaller mesh, so it depended on where. But then I would talk about them coming. So when they do all that, I'm under anyway. I don't feel it because I'm well under for a surgery. However, when they come back 10 days later to take the staples out, they might give you a little extra hit of morphine, but that's it. And it, so it would depend on the nurse how that felt, getting those staples out. And they have this special machine, this special little knit remover that they use. And they come in, and there was certain nurses I'd prefer do it, um, to take all those staples out, um, and hopefully all those staples out. However, every time I have an x-ray, they tell me there's a staple there. <laughs> so there's a few of them in my body somewhere, because it grew over, and they couldn't see them by the time they came back 10 days later to take them. 
Well, I was talking to my son about that the other day because of his, and I was asking if it had made a difference because I can only get my arms up this high. So it, I, they certainly could do something in my underarms. I just don't, I'm 71. Do I really want to have a surgery? You know, like, is it going to make that big of a difference in my life at this point? If I was still working, I might consider it. But I don't know. I think I might just live with it because I've certainly had enough surgeries. <laughs> I still have my appendix and I still have my tonsils and I, I didn't do any of those things. Yeah, yeah, and, and that, I, I certainly have had that question from kids. What if there's no window in my room? Well, then that shouldn't be your room. You know, there should be an escape. There should always be an escape. And one of the things that, that I taught the kids was to have that escape plan in place for the whole family to know that escape route is in place and to have a meeting place outside of your home that everybody knows that's where you're gonna be. I have a friend who went into the house to get his infant son out of the crib after he had gotten out safely himself only to find out later that his wife had already taken the infant son out and they didn't have a meeting place so she was in the backyard and he was in the front or the other way around and he wound up burns. He wouldn't have had any burns had he not gone back in to get his child. And so it's really important to always have that meeting place and everybody to know where it is so that when the firemen get there, yes, everybody's safe, here we all are. Or no, I think one of our kids is up in, the, in his bedroom or in his bedroom in the basement or wherever. The firemen need to know when they get there. And so that's a real help to them. If the, if the household can say everybody's accounted for. Or no, we do seem to be missing somebody. And I, the book that I read says, don't go back inside for any reason, not even your pets. And I told the kids all the time, firemen will go in and get your pets. I have met a lot of firemen in my life and they will be happy to go in and get your pets. They're dressed for it. They can do that safely. You can't. So, I mean, I, I met a fireman who went in and got somebody's goldfish because the kid was in, the kid was all upset that his goldfish was still in the house. So he went in and got the goldfish for him. They know how to do that safely. They're trained to do that safely. They're dressed for it. They're aware of how to do it. So d def never, never go back in. And yes, for sure, I always told kids, you need to have a, a way to get out. <laughs> Well, that's good, and that's, that's what happens, right? For me, remembering stop, drop, and roll and getting down low happened because Adam was in kindergarten, and he had been to the fire hall twice in the week before the fire. <laughs> He'd been to the hot fire hall with kindergarten and with daycare, because kindergarten was half day. So both had taken him, to, and he'd brought home all the pamphlets, and we'd read them together, and, and we'd done all that a week before. And he always said uh, his birthday was a week exactly a week after the fire, so Sunday was his 46th birthday. Um, all he wanted for that birthday was a fire truck. <laughs> so I kid him, but you didn't really mean the real one. <laughs> there was a metal one in the window of the toy store that he wanted. And I think somebody went and did get it for him, but he, um, yeah, he wanted a fire truck for his birthday. He got one. <laughs> Thank you.